guys, how's it going? So today I wanna to take you on a walk through our garden. There's a lot of fun and pretty things I wanna show you. And we are getting toward the end of September, so it's likely that this is gonna be the last garden tour where we see a bunch of beautiful annual color. So this is our hay rack project for this year. I've been super happy with it. And the goal of this project this year was to show you what kind of plants to choose for huge impact while using less plants. We have a window basket. They're like hay rack type planters along this fence. There are 44 of them all together. No, 40 of them all together that are 44 inches wide. Last year, I put 11 plants in each hay rack, which is an overreaction no matter what kind of plant you choose. This year, I only used five plants per hay rack, which honestly I could have just used four. So I went with Supertunia Vista bubblegum, Vista silverberry, and then one sweet potato vine. I could have gone without the sweet potato vine, to be honest with you, just in the last few weeks it's shown up. We didn't see it all summer. It just was kind of swallowed up by the Supertunias and I just thought, well, you know, I just learned something there. I guess I just don't need it. I mean, it is a pretty bright accent here and there along the hay racks, but I think it was kind of unnecessary maybe. So, I mean, just four plants per hay rack is an enormously amazing change from using 11 last year. Um, and I'm just so happy with the glorious color. We didn't do any trimming on them at all. The only maintenance we have done is spray them routinely with BT uh, to keep on top of budworms, which we did have a couple of outbreaks and they did go without flowers or very few flowers for a few weeks. Uh, a couple of different times and we did try to fertilize once a week with a water soluble plant food but they're all on drip systems so we don't have to even come out and water them it's just been a really low maintenance project really this right here i was very excited about so this is vertigo penicetum um, this is an annual grass i started from a four inch can four inch little grass i think maybe it was like this big when i planted it and it grew fast. They grow super, super fast, um, super big, very huge impact. And I really like the form they take. I'll show you what this grass looks like in the landscape over by the gazebo. It's amazing. It almost looks like it's going to come alive and come crawling across the grass toward you. It's so big. But I did put Supertunia bubblegum in these containers along with some Diamond Mountain Euphorbia, which held its own. I mean, I am pretty impressed with this Euphorbia. Um, it did kind of sit there for a little while and I couldn't see it and I thought, oh, dang it. Um, maybe that one can't keep up with these two because these uh, are beast annuals, this one and, and the grass. But this one eventually made its way out and it looks very pretty. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to start the tour up here just because of how glorious this has turned out. And then if we swing around and look at the backside, it's equally as amazing. And we had a lot of questions from you guys asking why we faced the hay racks toward the outside of our property rather than toward the inside where we could enjoy them. Um, if you plant stuff like this, you get beauty on both sides, but the goal was to make the entrance really pretty. So as you're driving down our lane right here, you could see these baskets and all that color as kind of this big, beautiful welcome. Um, so now we're gonna go into the garden. I think we'll go through Versailles first. There's some gorgeous annuals. I did wanna point out this view. I really enjoy this view as we come in. You can kind of see across the plants, they've got some Queen of Sweden roses. Um, there's some oak leaf hydrangeas in there. And this grass that I'm really excited about, this one's called totem pole. And it grows like, it's got blue, like a blue colored leaf, but it grows very um, upright and bold. And this is just its first year. It's a perennial grass. So I'm really excited about this one. It's a type of panicum. Um, but I love to be able to see across the Versailles garden, which I don't know why, like we didn't name this garden Versailles. Um, we we're actually thinking about renaming it. It was called that by the previous owners. I think maybe they had it even more formal than we do now, like with more containers and stuff. Um, anyway, the name just kind of stuck. So we'll go in through this entrance. The containers over here, we recently did an update video. Most of them look fairly similar. But real quick, I'll take you to a few that I think are looking pretty good. Um, of course, I think this one looks about the same, but the limoncello and the skyrocket penicetum have been amazing plants. It almost looks like that's the only thing I planted in there, but lots of color. My cousin It Pot is looking pretty bright. You know, with as, <laughs> as weird as this one kind of grew, I've really enjoyed kind of watching the progress. And also I just kind of skipped over this one, but Aaron's container has rebounded since we showed you last really beautifully. And there's a lot more blooms now. Really happy with that. 
This one has a little bit more color, but I did notice that we've got aphids on this one. So that's something. <laughs> I don't even know at this point if we will treat them just because we're so close to um, freezing temperatures. This one's still wild, but full of color. The alyssum is amazing. Now, don't you think it would be so pretty just to use one plain the blues in the middle so that it didn't kind of separate like the three have and just this around the outside? Wouldn't that be striking? It's really fun to learn um, which things do really well together and then maybe do some like variations of the plantings we did this year, but kind of make them better next year. Aaron's container right here has really been a great performer. For as funny as it was in the beginning when he planted it, it looked very scant compared to the rest of um, both my pots and his. You know, he only put one can in the center and then I can't remember, maybe five lemon coral around the outside. I might be wrong. There may have been a few more than that, but it really has grown beautifully. It's been uh, really colorful. It almost has a more modern feel to it and it looks a little more clean, less messy. And then this is the last one I wanted to show you guys, just because I think it looked about like this when we showed you in the update. But this Alyssum, the Blushing Princess, has just been such an amazing performer. And I just think this whole container looks so delicate. I love the color choice. Okay, now let's head into the garden. So there's a few things that I want to show you in here, starting with these containers that we planted up a little while ago. And I used fall colors on purpose in these because I really wanted them to be kind of a bright spot right here. I previously didn't have any containers right here. And putting these here has made me really want to change these pavers out. Um, and we do want to do like some kind of stacked rock or brick or something like that. So that may be on the docket for next spring. Um, these were here when we moved in. They were hidden underneath the big giant privet hedges that were in place right here and they got unearthed when we pulled all the privets out and we just left them because it's a good way to keep the mulch from getting into the rocks and vice versa. Um, they're just kind of a placeholder until we're ready to do that step. So anyway, putting these containers here though really made it glaring to me, but these plants have done so beautifully. This one right here in particular, this is called Campfire Flame Bidens. Look at that, that's one plant, this whole thing. I mean, it's like half the pot now. It has just filled in and it's full of buds, full of color, perfect for fall. Super tunia honey, and I don't really know what this is, like what's going on right here. Um, it doesn't have budworms. I've thoroughly checked, there's no budworm damage, but there is a lot of pretty color. There's Dichondra Silver Falls, which <laughs> this started in a four inch size container and it's just grown like crazy already. Uh, Super Bell's Tangerine Punch, and then I think you can see this flambe a little bit better. Flambe yellow, really beautiful with the icy blue foliage. And then a toffee twist carex, which definitely looks fall. And then up here, I just recently, and I hope you saw the video where we decorated this area for fall, planted up these containers. In fact, if you didn't have a chance to see it, I'll put the link down below. I'm really happy with it and kind of proud of how it came out because I gathered a lot of things from my own garden and it just looks so festive. I love it. Um, but I wanted to talk about a couple of things over here. So first off, this area, there are a lot of things in my garden that need to be cut back at this point, including this denim and lace Russian sage. It is a type of Russian sage that stays a lot smaller, like two and a half-ish feet tall and wide. And it was just beautiful, staying nice and upright. It does not get very much water here and a lot of sun. Um, but we had a monster rainstorm come through here not that long ago, and it just laid my plants out, some of them. Um, so that's what happened to these. These don't normally flop here because typically when a Russian sage flops, it's because it's getting too much water, not enough light, or it just might be an older variety that's really huge and sometimes they just get heavy and flop. So um, anyway, this one will come through and cut back here pretty quick. But I think that now that these sprinter boxwoods are getting so big and they're starting to fill in so beautifully, um, I want to do something in terms of annual color that's a little taller next year. And I'm thinking maybe Gomfrina, the Truffula Pink, um, because it'll be a nice layer of the purple Russian Sage, the pink Gomfrina, and then my boxwoods. And then I won't have this thing going on either, which every year I've had my annuals kind of spill out, you know, past the boxwoods, which hasn't been a problem up until now. And it's not a problem, except that now that the boxwoods are trying to create more of a hedge, I would rather it have be like have a clean line be a little bit cleaner right there. Supertunia Vista Paradise. 
This plant was a new vista, I think this year, and it's got more of like a neon pink quality to it. And this plant has done amazing. Everything that we put up here up to this point has suffered a little bit um, because this whole area, these aren't watered by drip. They're watered from our overhead sprinklers. So we have to water this area quite a bit because the coverage is weird because this whole area is shaped weird. Um, so whatever we put here has to be able to endure lots of water, overhead water, hard water, and these plants have done it without any maintenance. I've done no trimming. Um, they've been sprayed like our hair racks with BT on a routine basis to keep budworms out and then weekly fertilizer and that is it. And I didn't have to plant as many, I don't think, uh, of these as I did with other plants. So, you know, if you choose a Supertunia Vista for a container or for your landscape, you know, you might have an area where you usually plant 10 things, 10 annuals. You may only need two or three of a Vista Supertunia to fill up that space as opposed to the other things maybe you're used to planting. So just something to kind of log away and think about. There's also a new Supertunia coming out next year called um, Snowdrift, and I'll show you that on the west side of our house. It's glorious. We planted it at my parents' house as well, and I've just really loved it, and it's white. Um, so it's nice to have a Vista Supertunia that's white. This flower bed is still in deep construction. I feel like next year, I mean, we've got some big holes. We're gonna show you it in a little bit, but I really wanna work on like cultivating my flower beds and putting in some more perennials and some other things to create a lot of diversity. And a lot of areas like this one was brand new last year, just starting to fill it in. Um, and there's, you know, there's lots of holes and lots of um, gaps that I want to fill and create a really, like really pretty borders all the way around our house. Um, this right here, I just wanted to give you a little update. This is the uh, statue that I stained in a recent-ish video. She's doing really well right here. I thought maybe she would get hit with sprinkler water and then I'd have like a hard water issue, but so far I don't think she's getting hit with anything and she looks really good. She almost has like a bronze quality to her now, as opposed to looking kind of like chippy pink. It was kind of weird, the patina she was taking on. So really enjoyed her here with the sedum and the Russian sage, which this is an older variety of Russian sage right here. Wants to get a lot bigger. I planted a red obelisk beech, kind of forgot about it. I wouldn't get too close, Heron. It's not looking super hot. Uh, it still has life in all of its branches. So I'm thinking maybe it just needs to lose its leaves. We'll see what happens next year. Here's an ash tree that I absolutely love. We're just starting to see a little bit of fall color come out. There's not a lot of fall color on our trees yet. I'm seeing like tinges of orange and tinges of yellow. Um, so I'm hoping to do another walkthrough like late October or maybe mid-October once we get some really cold nights and hopefully we'll get to show you a lot of fun color. But I did want to talk about this area underneath our crabapple tree. Um, so we applied Molmax, which is a gopher repellent, to this whole area because I was having such a bad problem with gophers coming through for the past three years, and they would eat the roots out of my out from under my plants, and my plants kept dying. Um, and so I didn't really do a lot of work in this area until really this year. I started planting a little bit more after we applied that repellent, and I haven't noticed any gopher activity here or anywhere around here. So I'm thinking and hopeful that it worked and so that I can really focus on this area next year without worrying about my plants perishing at the hands of a gopher. And then right up here, the sun's starting to come out and I see, it looks like we might have a storm later on today, but um, it does highlight this gomfrina quite well. So I didn't know gomfrina grew this big. <laughs> Like, you know, I can read tags, but you see this little tiny plant and even I like question the tags sometimes. And I'm like, you know, oh, look at this. We've got a nice weed growing up right here. Little sneaker. Uh, yeah, so I just overplanted my gomfrina because I just didn't believe it was gonna get as big as the tag said it would. Um, so I have six Atlas roses <laughs> planted in here as well and a limelight hydrangea. I've got two ginger wine nine barks, which you can kind of see. And then you can kind of see my evergreen and the king tuts behind and the grass that I never staked up that I should have over there. Um, so if you have a sunny area that you need a lot of color all season long, that gets really big that you don't want to plant a whole lot of, do the truffle of pink gonfrina. Um, also, it does better with underwater, like drip irrigation, as opposed to overhead water. Like if you look at them from this direction, you can see how much bigger these have gotten than these right here. 
Um, this hole, like this cutout here and this one right here are both overhead watered um, with the, the grass. Uh, and so everything we put in here kind of, you know, suffers a little bit. And we're thinking about retooling this whole area because you can see right here that we've got a lot of different things going on. I mean, I've got gray stairs and pink concrete and gray concrete and pavers and our sidewalk here doesn't meet our sidewalk here. And this pathway, oops, sorry, Cheddar, this pathway isn't straight to our door. It goes off, like I think to the right a little bit. So if you're standing up there, it doesn't look exactly straight, which bugs Aaron, I think a little bit more than it does me. But I think both of us would like to have this look a little bit more unified. And I don't know that it's gonna be on the docket for next year because um, now that the elm is gone by the chicken coop and all the oaks, we've got huge projects to do back there. So this may remain another year, but I'm really uh, looking forward to making this a little bit more balanced right here and maybe having, you know, the cutouts be the same shape and and that sort of thing but it's been kind of fun to experiment with different kind of plants and it's also i mean it's good to know what plants will do given different situations um lime light hydrangeas have really done well in this spot i actually been cutting a few um they were just completely loaded but i have a couple bouquets around the house that i wanted to enjoy some of those blooms um, but I've really in, enjoyed those being right here because you can see them from inside the house. And I kind of toyed with like doing little limes or should I do limelights because limelights will sometimes get, I mean, really good size. Um, and I cut these back fairly hard uh, in the early spring when they start to bud uh, and they've stayed a very nice size. So I'm even um, like for next year, I'm hoping they're even thicker because I think this is year, what year is this Aaron? Is this three year three? For these yeah so this is the third year they've been in this spot and they've done really well okay so now i kind of want to go this direction and go out and look at the west side oh while we're here i will mention um that well you can see the limetta hedge we've had a lot of questions about how the limetta hydrangeas are doing because they really look quite similar to the way they looked last year when i planted them it was really late in the season i discovered early on that they are getting overhead water from our grass sprinklers so they're covered in hard water but that will be different because everything in this area, other than a few key plants and the limettas and boxes are, will be torn out next year. And we're gonna do something new on this side, which I'm very excited about. And it should be a lot, um, I think more cohesive to the feel of our property. So as we come out, you can see like the corner here, we'll go in through that, but I wanted to point out this Supertunia Vista snowdrift. Like you can see it in all of the swoops around the Red Point Maples. They have just put on kind of this new flush of blooms and I only planted six of them per area. So you can kind of see there's one, two, three, four, five, six. It was perfect and it looked so like weak when I put all six in there and I just thought I could plant like three times that amount in this area so that it looked more full and Aaron was like, no, give it time, let's see what it does. And that was just perfect. Um, and the fact that they're bright white, I mean, it's just given such a beautiful pop to this area because they just shine. Uh, and then with the boxwood, you know, that really shiny green and then the white tones, that's kind of made us feel like maybe we should keep this more of a white and green garden uh, because of the formality, because of all the boxwoods. And I really like that look. We don't have any other area in our garden where we stay strict with color or any of that. So it might be kind of a fun challenge for me just to uh, learn how to restrain myself and work with a lot of different bloom types, bloom seasons, and lots of different foliage color and texture. So this should be a fun project if that's how we decide to go with it. This little corner right here, I actually planted from things I had in my greenhouse really late in the season. They actually didn't look good when I planted them. The grasses looked good but the annuals did not. I cut them back really hard and they immediately burned when I put them out because it was like close to 100 degrees and I thought, well, that was a waste. I just dug a bunch of holes for nothing, but they all rebounded almost. There's one, two, three. I think I lost three of the marguerite daisies is all. Um, and all of them have just performed beautifully. And this has become one of my favorite little spots. There are seven purple fountain grasses in here. Yes, yeah, seven. And they just, like, you can see them moving in the breeze. It's just such a peaceful look. And then, of course, these two colors together are 
kind of perfection to me. So this might be something we do in like the brick circle area or somewhere else in our garden because of how beautifully they have done together. Uh, we've got the Suncredible sunflowers here uh, with just a bunch of other stuff. So there's hot and cold nephophia we planted early on. They're actually putting on new buds right now. Here's a fresh one right here. I think that color is just beautiful. It's got the hint of apricot with kind of the creamy yellow. I have, um, this is a black cat, cat pussy willow. There is a gopher mound in here. I just saw this yesterday. See that? That's a gopher mound. So I gotta come out here and take care of that. But there's blue hubbard squash in here. I planted a lot of squash and random things in this area. Uh, butternut squash here. I had a butternut in here that got kind of decimated by squash bugs. So you can see what it looks like. I came out with a mixture of spinosad and neem and sprayed the entire plant and area down and actually took care of the squash bugs, but they had already pretty much taken care of my plant for me. I just haven't come out here to do any cleanup and I'll probably wait to clean it all up until everything else is done. Uh, most of these I planted really late on July 1st actually from seed. Look at this. So even though some of my squash are gonna be really small, it's still really fun and they provide such a beautiful kind of ground cover. Oh, look at that. There's a neat one. I see one over there. Very fun. Uh, three king tuts right here. Also planted really late, so they didn't get quite as big, and I'm kind of glad they didn't. They look so pretty right here. Did you think that's a beautiful structure? And this is something, like, I saw this little grouping of three grasses, and I thought, ooh, wouldn't that be pretty to do, like, a bunch of the king tuts? Like maybe in between each one of the urns. I don't know. Might see these again in this spot. Again, a whole bunch of squash in here. Uh, the urns did fairly well. The uh, fountain grass did great. Dichondra Silver Falls. Super Bells didn't do as well as I hoped they were going to do. And it's mainly because they suffered from budworms so bad. Look at this. Like there's just... We recently sprayed, so hopefully the budworms that created this damage are no longer on the plant, but they really don't have a ton of time to rebound. So we'll see what happens. They've been just a nice little white accent. The Arborvitas, you guys, have been amazing. So, and I've, I've said this before, but when we planted them, they were only just right above that middle beam on the fence, and they've grown like, this much and they've grown so wide. If this is their third year in the ground, second, third, two and a half years because we planted them in the middle of summer. It was 104 degrees outside. And so they only got like half a season in the ground and they've been in the ground for two full seasons after that. And that's how fast they've grown. And they, the winter after we planted these was the winter it got negative 17 and we got 52 inches of snow. And I was so worried about them because we didn't wrap anything. We typically don't here because we don't have that kind of winter, but none of them suffered from any kind of breakage or splitting or anything. So I'm really sold on this variety. We do have them on their own drip system. So they are not connected to anything else in this area because I feel like that's where you have to dial it in. And Aaron actually, controls all of the water on these. That's like his, uh, his pet project. So he has the drip running on these every other day for about 30 minutes, um, just to give you kind of an idea. And that's how they look. Okay, so now we'll head down to the vegetable garden. You can see the rogue marigold plant. I have no idea where that came from, but it's so glorious and healthy. Totally messing up my scheme over here, but it doesn't matter. I kind of like when that's, that kind of thing happens. It's like serendipitous gardening. Still have to come out and trim up boxwoods. We started boxwood trimming this week um, because it's like we stay high 90s and then all of a sudden we get cool. Um, so I don't trim boxwoods until it's below 90 degrees out. So hopefully they have enough time to acclimate before it starts getting you know more hard frost. My sunflowers are just now starting to like, oh, I seeded the, oh, they're, they're forming some seeds. That's exciting. I seeded these on July 1st as well, along with the squash. And they came up and bloomed beautifully. There's some color in here still. Some little like wee ones. Um, so that was kind of a fun little pocket of color. I did not coil up the hose because I didn't think about it, but the vegetable garden is still going like crazy. Um, this is the tomato that I hacked back brutally. 
and it's performed like I haven't been able to keep up. I really need to come out and pick stuff um, still. We've got zinnias here. These are the giant salmon. Is it benaries, benaries, giant salmon, um, zinnias, and then there's queen lime red right here. Look at this, look at this color. They are so beautiful and so huge. I recently uh, harvested all of our corn, uh, which is perfect. I'm gonna plant garlic back in this spot, um, probably in the next couple of weeks. And I'm only gonna plant one bed of garlic this year because we just didn't go through it like I thought we were gonna go through it this year. We've got some dahlias. I'm kind of like going back and forth here. I've got dahlias here that are blooming and some Blue Lake pole beans. In this bed, I have, well, all four of these, I have the obelisk in the corner uh, with the lemon appeal thimbergia. This is a garden gem tomato with buried treasure red strawberries. All the way, look at all these strawberries. Starting to ripen. Benjamin usually keeps these pretty cleaned up. He knows where to come out here. I've got some basil that seeded itself and some lettuce and spinach coming up, little seedlings here. And this bed I have parsnips. This is the first time I've ever grown them. And you're supposed to seed them. We seeded them in the spring. You're supposed to leave them through the winter and harvest them the next like February because the sugars start to form when it gets cold this winter. Uh, so this has been an experimental planting. It's been a nice looking crop um, and we'll see what happens, you know, when I harvest. I have no idea what to expect. A basil basil, smelling amazing. I've got a bunch of bell peppers and hot peppers in this area and they are producing so, whoa, I guess we're eating those tonight. Shoot, I've got tons, look at this. They're just like, they're producing like beasts. This whole plant is so weighted down. You'd think I could properly stake something around here. Staking is just like something that I, I have a weakness. I just don't stake things, um, like grasses, this type of thing, until it's so late. I don't know why that is. I just cannot get myself to wrap my brain around staking stuff early on in the season. Um, but another beautiful stem of bell peppers. So I'm gonna put that there. Erin, you have to remind me. Ah, beautiful dahlias right here. Look at these. I do not know what variety they are. I found a bag, I bought those like in February and I found the bag in the barn in July. <laughs> I totally forgot about them. Same with the white ones I showed you down there and there's a gorgeous one in bloom here. So I planted them because I thought, well, I may as well pop them in somewhere where I have some space and see what they do. I mean, it's never a waste usually. You usually can learn something. Got some more zinnias here, some polar bears. This is uh, called Envy right here. We've got Purple Prince. There's Isabellina, which is that kind of palish yellow right here. And then we've got Queen Lime Orange. So I think this is my favorite. Queen Lime Orange, and then this is Cinderella Peach right here. I already bought a bunch of these seeds for next year. <laughs> I've got tomatoes in this bed, uh, more pole beans. Look at this dahlia right here. It's perfection right there. And then I planted a cantaloupe fairly late in the season on a uh, A-frame trellis that Gardener Supply sent out. Uh, and it's got cantaloupe all over on it. So I'm just waiting. I don't think, I just checked this one yesterday, but they're not slipping the vine yet. So they're not quite ripe and they need to hurry. They've only got a few days to do their thing. Okay, so now let's go back into the garden. You know, I really should talk about these really quick. I planted these containers uh, beginning of April, before Easter. And I thought, you know, I had bunny silhouettes. That was kind of my thriller. And I moved them out here just to give them a ton of sun and thought that I was gonna be replacing them, you know, swapping some stuff out. And I never ended up doing it because the plants just looked so good. So there's white night alyssum. Look at this, look at how huge. That's, I think, one plant. I think I only put one alyssum in each one. That's amazing. There's a osteospermum called Double, Bright Lights Double Moon Glow. And it's got gorgeous pale yellow and with uh, dark yellow in the center. There's a pentas in here, Egyptian star flower. And there's an Amazon Twist Carex in this one. This one didn't do so well. It's, it's in there, but it's small. And then there's a Picasso in purple. 
supertunia. Anyway, I just meant to use like really light kind of pastel-y colors, something bright for Easter, and they ended up being really pretty containers throughout the whole season out here. So like if you play your cards right and pick the right annuals, you can have them from very early in the season all the way till, I mean, it frosts pretty hard. So these are probably keep going for the next several weeks. Sweet Romance Lavender is looking great too. I never cut it back midsummer. Um, and so th its first flush of blooms are still in there, but it flushed out again and it's looking really pretty. So we did a video not long ago planting up these containers for fall. We used the Autumn Colors Rudbeckia, uh, Goldie, Creeping Jenny, and some Cherry Truffles Heuchera. And then I used some corn tassels or corn stalks, I should say, from my own garden. Um, and they've done really well, lots of color, really beautiful and simple. Um, and then I do want to take off this direction, but I wanted to point out our brick circle there. Lemon coral around the bottom, Diamond Mountain Euphorbia. In fact, we can get a little closer. Play in the Blues, Salvia, King Tuts. So this has been a learning experience um, and I kind of knew. Aaron really wanted to use King Tuts either here or in the front estate planters. I talked him out of the front estate planters because that whole area up there gets just nailed with wind, but so does this area. And you can tell the wind comes from this direction right here. It totally laid things flat right here to where there is Play in the Blues planted here, but now they're growing this way because the wind just keeps on hitting these plants. Um, so I think next year we'll try to do something that's either a little stronger because the King Tuts just did not hold up and it's not the plant's fault. <laughs> um, we could have staked them to begin with had we thought of doing that. Um, they probably would have stayed a little bit more put and then they would have been a little bit more filled in up here. Um, but I would have really had to stake the Play in the Blues as well. Now the bottom two plants though, they've kind of held their own. This is the Diamond Mountain and that's just such a beautiful example of what it looks like. This is kind of more of a landscape planting situation. I mean, it looks like kind of a big giant container, but it is, you know, planted straight in soil. So these have done really well. And I mean, this play in the blues, I've said it a million times. This is one of my favorite annuals because you don't have to deadhead them ever. They always look like this. They're always full of honeybees and you just feel like you're doing something good when you put these in the ground for all that they provide and all they really give back um, without having to maintain them. I just love them. So this is a view that I've been really happy with this year. As you look toward our back kitchen door, this is our main entrance for us anyway. We go in and out this way, so we're constantly walking down the sidewalk and this looks dramatically different than it did when we moved in. When we moved in, there was the big privet hedging and there were roses in this area that made this pathway even more narrow than it currently is. And they would snag your clothes or snag your grocery bags or whatever. So, um, and they didn't get enough sun. Right here, they got, got plenty of sun, but not on this side. And this side was full of them as well. Um, so we had all the roses removed. They actually went to a friend's house and I think all but maybe two uh, survived. And they were big, old, mature, established roses. So that was a pretty good ratio. Um, but we've just been slowly working on this area. I've got a hedge of incredible hydrangeas that I planted last year that got smashed down at the garden center. So there was a big red point maple. Like this is only the second year in the ground. And so it was a huge tree like this sitting in a big like cage. They come in metal cages with plastic around them. Um, so it was sitting in the nursery and in a windstorm it fell over on top of five incredible hydrangeas. And I knew how tough the plant was and how quickly they grow. So I just decided to bring them home and just thought, well, we'll see what happens. I'll plant them here. Um, and then hopefully in a couple of years, we'll have a nice full hedge. And they really rebounded nicely because last year they were, they were pretty bad and pretty misshapen and they still are correcting. It'll take probably another couple seasons for them to really fill in this area, especially like this one was the most smashed, but it bloomed and it has leaves and um, you know, it's, it's doing it. So we'll just see what happens there. But we've got Munstead Lavender on both sides. I love that you can look through and you see the new trellises. Uh, we installed those in a video this summer and I love them. Like I don't even care if the clematis grow or not. I just love, cause we planted three pink neat clematis on the bottom. I just love to look at them. They're like perfect for that wall. They're the right height and they are the right look. Like they're the right style. I just love it. Um, these containers right here have been especially wonderful. So these are a megawatt pink with bronze leaf, I think is what they're called, begonia, diamond frost euphorbia, and dichondra silver falls. 
They're all very drought tolerant uh, annuals, which means they don't need a lot of water. So we water them every couple of days and they just bloom their heads off and do really well, even though they get nailed with wind. Um, in this little corner right here, this has been kind of fun. Now I do need to water. We had a lot of wind last night um, and I haven't watered yet today, but we planted some white wonder caladiums, white pansies, ferns in this area. And there are some foxgloves that come up earlier in the season, but I'm hoping next year this area is just like full and those ferns get bigger and I'm gonna dig these white wonders up in the next week store them and then hopefully plant them back right here so I can have a huge show of caladiums right here. This is a coleus called Ridiculous, which I will plant again. So there was that huge patch around the red point maple there and then this patch here uh, and they've done really well. They just now started to flower. They did not flower all season, which is perfect. I don't want my coleus to flower. Um, and I think they've been bred to either flower very, very sporadically, like not very much or not at all or very late in the season. And that's what I found. This is a new one this year. Um, so I was, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but they've just been pretty clean from blooms um, and just a really good performer. Just planted these Limetta hydrangeas in here, which I love those. And this whole area is just feeling, I don't know, it's just feeling more full. The um, North Star boxwoods here just formed a hedge this year. I planted them in a tiny little, I mean, they were about like this big when I planted them. So, and I wanna keep them like a really short, tight hedge. We've got some hellebores in back or, you know, back planted. Um, and so I think that's been a really fun look right here. This whole area has been really fun. We planted some caladiums in here. There are a lot of hostas and there's quite a bit of, a, of development I still wanna do, but oh my goodness, if you come this way and look back, it's like through this flower bed. I love that. Look at all the layers and all the colors. You can see the coleus and the boxwood hedge and the Incrediballs in our truck <laughs> parked there, um, which it's just life, but you can just see all the different colors and textures. And that's how I want my whole garden to feel. But when you go this way, I think this is equally as important to have an expanse of something that's unobstructed, green, peaceful, a place for your eye to rest. If it was just my whole garden was just full of all kinds of different plants and flower beds and stuff, I don't think I would feel as at ease as I do with having a nice green area like this. And this is our biggest section of grass right here. And it probably will reduce a little bit. We are going to deepen some of these flower beds around here um, eventually, but I think we will keep kind of the core of grass going right here. Invincible Ruby hydrangeas in this spot right here. They're doing well, just hanging, hanging out. We just planted them not that long ago. But I guess the first thing I should have mentioned is that the oaks are gone, so the view is very different. Um, it's been an interesting year for us for trees. Um, I knew the oaks were going to come out, and I was, I was excited, I, I can't lie to you. I mean, they have had something viral going on that was starting to spread and, and all that, but, um, and I didn't like that they held their leaves all winter, and I just had a leaf mess all year long. Um, but more than that, I just wanted to redo this space, and I feel like I couldn't really visualize what I wanted to do over here without with them there because they were such an enormous part of this section. Um, so it did open up the view to the kind of corner garden area out there, the triangle shaped garden. I don't even know what to call it, but you can see our fountain now. Um, this whole flower bed's been really fun. You can really see the lemon jade sedum just shining right there. There's more Supertina Vista snowdrifts. In fact, we can get a little closer. I do, do need to come in and trim up the willow just a little bit, but there's some velveteen coleus and then lime or limelight, excuse me, hydrangeas there. Um, and then I do have some plants in here that I have kind of purposely let kind of do their own thing. These right here are called Morden Blush Roses. Um, they usually bloom a, a lighter, softer pink, but when the colors or when the temperature goes down, the color intensifies. But I never deadhead these roses like in the spring after their first or the summer, early summer after their first flush because they create the most gorgeous rose hips to use in arrangements. So I just let them do their thing back here. And then I've got a gorgeous hawthorn tree right here that's full of red berries. Um, so it's just a really fun area, especially when stuff starts to lose their leaves. I mean, we'll be left with all of those beautiful berries to look at. So this area is a big giant hole right now. I've actually enjoy looking at this flower bed right now it feels almost more it feels lighter and it feels like I can see what's here and it doesn't feel shrouded by this huge hedge of oaks 
it just, it, it feels lighter. I don't know. Um, Cause I never really enjoyed this area very much. And I really haven't done like a ton to redo anything. You know, we took out the little pond that was there and uh, Benjamin's little teepee, it's almost filled in. <laughs> in fact, let's get a little closer. It's almost filled into the top. It's taken all year, but oh my word. I mean, this lemon appeal from Bergia, it's all, all the way out here. Like that, it, that plant is a beast, but it just uh, didn't grow up very, very quickly. And I, it would have probably if I would have trained it a little bit better. Um, but I don't think Benjamin cares that much this year anyway. I still have some pumpkins to harvest. Check this out. I counted the other day and I think there's 20 some, what, what was it, 23 of these little pumpkins left on the vine. I've already harvested some out. So I guess I need to address the fact that we have a huge hole right here and you can see to the barn the elm tree is gone and I have to say that of all the trees we've had removed in our garden that actually made me want to cry I never all the other trees like I knew that their time was up they were diseased they were damaged they were dropping big um, branches and all that sort of thing and I never felt bad about removing anything because I know that we always are replacing things and uh, planting more stuff this was an elm tree that I didn't really like the fact that it was an elm tree because it dropped those little white elm seeds everywhere and then I'd end up with millions of elm seedlings everywhere and it was dropping, it dropped that big branch if you guys remember like during when we were filming a video and then the other day like last week I was standing right out here on the brick pathway by that grass and one of the big trunks fell over right in front of me. So I was so nervous. I called um, Natural Tree is the service we use here who are amazing by the way. I called Carol right away and she had the guys out here the next morning to clean up that one big branch and then they came within the week to remove the rest of it and I knew I was going to have to remove that tree probably next year um, and, but once it started to fall apart I knew it had to be done right away and I think that stuff like that even though it's sad it does I, don't, I think there's some life lessons to learn in it because I feel like in order to grow we have to change and sometimes we're forced into that by nature or by whatever the circumstances are. And it makes us more flexible. It makes us, um, I don't know, I think it's good. It's good for the garden, that tree was done. It was telling us it was done. Um, now we should probably go take a closer look. So this is where the elm tree lived. This was its little spot right here. In fact, I was just noticing this. <laughs> I wonder where this belongs. I wonder if we're gonna have a leak somewhere around here when the water turns back on. But so it took up this whole section right here, the three trunks did, and it just graced the corner of our chicken coop so beautifully. Um, and it just, it hurt my heart a little bit just to see it come down uh, because it was so huge and it provided the perfect amount of shade for this area. But the guys that come in here and do this job, like they do it so clean and so tidy, like a huge tree like that, and there's barely any damage just a little bit that I would show you, thought I would show you. It's right here. There was a huge branch that came over and these are all annuals, so it doesn't matter. So these sustained a little bit of damage here. If it was early enough in the season, I'd probably cut the coleus back and they would flush back, but I would probably be pulling these out next week after they hit a frost anyway. So it's really not that big a deal. Um, same over here. I did notice that there were several branches. There was one because it was coming over the pergola. There was a big branch that came over the pergola, a big one that went over the chicken coop run. And there's just no way that you can remove a tree that huge and not like break a single branch of a plant around it. Um, right here, the wicked hot coleus was filling in this whole thing and that got um, broken off here. So it exposed all this chocolate drop that was not exposed before. Um, and then same, right here but like i said these are going to probably coleus is really susceptible to frost so these are going to probably get nipped in the next probably week uh, so i'd be pulling them out anyway so i'm just going to enjoy their color for the amount of time that they have left uh, i still love this view you know through the pergola you can see into the back garden you can see the iceberg roses are in bloom right now um, in fact i don't even know which way we should walk i feel like it's really pretty let's walk this way I love this. This is Virginia creeper. Um, and I like to let some of the vines grow down. It feels really magical to me. I planted some mulberry shades pansies in with my gem box Ilex in here. And we've got gold child ivy. And this little spot's been really nice. So we've got some mahogany monster hookra, hookras, hookrellas? Can't remember, hookras. 
and some all gold Hakana Chloa, which I planted these from plugs. They haven't grown much, but they're doing okay. Um, we've got some Empress Wu hostas. There are six in here. And it takes about four or five years for a hosta to reach its full mature size. So I am excited to see this whole area just like decked out in that really bold texture. Um, and then you can just see, you know, the Brunnera in here. We planted this Brunnera this year along with the wildberry hookeras around the front. And it is a little messy because it's fall. We had a windstorm last night. Um, so we have some pine needles and some leaves and stuff around, but that's just how fall gardens look. Okay. I wanted to show you this view. Come this way. Do you guys do that like in your own gardens? There's a specific route you wanna take because you enjoy a view from a specific angle. Like, I mean, we walk this way, you can see, sorry, I'm like pinging all over the place here. You can see the pallet walkway. We're going on year, how come I can't remember any of the years? Is this two years old now? Year. Yeah, second year on this pallet walkway, no rot. And you guys have to understand that we don't live in an area that gets very much rain. Typically, we've had two very mild winters, so uh, we've gotten really lucky. Now, I did expect that in a couple years I'd have to come in and replace some of the slats, but I haven't had to yet. We don't have termites here that I know about, or we don't have a bad problem. And I, I just noticed those were some of the very common questions like, is it going to rot or how quickly is that going to you know, deteriorate? And then is it going to get eaten up by termites or attract termites? But it's done neither of those things. So. Anyway, I really like how it meanders through here. I think it's really pretty. I have a crab apple tree that actually will be more happy now that the elm tree's gone, it's gonna get more sun. In fact, I think most everything in this flower bed's gonna be happier. There were a lot of uh, comments I noticed about the elm tree um, because a lot of you guys can commiserate with me. You've been there, you've lost big trees, um, but you wondered about the plants around it. Like, oh, are you gonna have to transition? A lot of your plants were liking shade and now they're gonna be in full sun. Most of the plants in here will either just get morning sun or they will be happy to be in full sun because I've got hibiscus and baptisia. Um, I've got Veronica in here and foxglove that want sun. The uh, hookeras can take sun or shade. So I don't think I'm gonna have to transition a single thing. I think this whole bed is actually gonna do better than it did before. So there is a silver lining there. Um, and then everything in here will do much better as well. Um, real quick, I wanted to talk about two different plants, the Helen von Stein lamb's ear. Um, that seems to be a, a common question as to what variety this is because it's just so glorious and bold and beautiful color. So Helen von Stein is the variety and that's my preferred dusty, not dusty miller, lamb's ear variety. And I just planted a Gatsby gal hydrangea in here. This is an oak leaf hydrangea that's showing some fall color in on its, some of its leaves, but I just think it's gonna do real well right here because it'll get a little protection in the afternoon, just right in this particular spot, but it'll get some morning sun and, and kind of midday sun. So I think it's gonna be beautiful. And this variety gets about five to six feet tall and wide. There's the girls, a few of them. The other ones are probably in the coop. And it's surprising to me how much I still love this view, even with the oaks being gone, because like so much of the structure in this area is just a big massive hole with no mulch covering the drip tubes. I still love to look down here. I still love all of the layers that are in here. I've got Mary Rose, David Austin's in here, some dahlias that volunteered and came up. I've got my little uh, hedge of blue fescue, which I know some of you really, really love. Um, some of you love it, some of you don't like it. Uh, Aaron is one in the camp of not liking it, but I think it looks good for now. Uh, Penicetum in here, but look at this right here in particular. So you can see the lemon appeal, the penicetum, the lamium, the gomphrena, the white gomphrena, wicked hot coleus. Then you can see through the gazebo, you can see the patio lights and the patio table and then the grass texture on the other side of the gazebo. It's just so pretty. There's just certain little pockets and I think you need to celebrate those little pockets in your garden that feel complete and that feel like, oh, I got the colors and textures right in that area. And I just like, it, I enjoy looking at that. And so celebrate that view and try not to look at the other views. <laughs> so just a couple other things. I realized that this tour is getting really long. When the tree fell over, it broke our fence right here. Uh, didn't damage very much other than the fence, uh, which we got lucky. Like this is the Proudberry Coralberry. It's looking gorgeous and full of blooms. Fluffy Arborvita there. Did not wreck our uh, arbors or our pots. Um, so we got extremely lucky and we had talked about, Erin and I were toying with the idea of removing this whole entire fence and doing something different. 
So this might be nature's way of just telling us to just go ahead and do that. So I just feel like this is gonna be a huge project for next year. We have all winter to think about it. And you guys know that I've kind of struggled with what to do with this area. It always has felt like kind of um, like sequestered off, like not really part of our property. And why do I even go back here? What's the reason for this garden? So maybe removing the fence and creating something new will give this space more life um, back here. So I'd love to know what you guys would do with this spot. I mean, we've talked about stacked rock fences, like dry stacked rock fences, rock walls, you know, making uh, our land feel a little more contoured, maybe bringing in some soil and creating some berms with some rock wall kind of terrace look. Um, so we've got a lot of different ideas floating around. I think we need to have some time though to really think about a time when we're not, you know, working on other stuff. So I think this winter will be a really fun time to think about all the things that we can do. Because, you know, right now there's just not a ton going on. I did want to show you the firelight hydrangeas though before we get too far. This is the hedge that we planted this spring. Um, they're just beautiful. They are so pretty and you can see clearly that they're like big, 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 smaller, smaller, smallest. And I think what's happening is that this one is not getting, like the willow is stealing all the water um, because that's right at the drip line of the willow. So I added an extra emitter, but it was a little late in the season. So I'm thinking next year, I think I added extra on these three. So these all get normal. Usually I do two, two gallon per hour emitters for each hydrangea. Uh, and we run the drips every day. And then these have two two gallon and one one gallon per hour emitter to each one of these. So I'm thinking that will help these rebound. But these bloomed white and now they're turning this glorious color. And I actually harvested some of these and used them in that little swag I made above our door in our fall, fall display. So they'll get even darker than this. But I'm really happy with them. I think that they look great. And for being a first year, like they didn't really shock or anything they just bloom their heads off and have turned color and been really happy okay so i want to end the tour right here <laughs> um this is the front of the chicken coop of course i wanted to show you the view of the front of the chicken coop without the elm tree this is the saddest thing of all to me i don't mind the view from behind because there's a lot of pretty things going on back there but we'll go ahead and throw a picture of what it looked like with the elm tree right behind it I almost don't want to do that because then you'll see how glorious it looked. It just like, it just hugged the corner of that chicken coop and it was just so majestic. I mean, especially in the winter time, it just so pretty. Um, so now, I mean, we've got a lot of open opportunity to put in some trees that do better here that don't have to be, you know, you don't have to dump chemicals on them to keep them nicer, to keep the borers out. Um, I am gonna have to figure out something for the chickens though, and I will. Um, so it's either gonna be, I will be putting shade cloth on their run. Um, and I might even be installing an AC unit <laughs> in their coop. Uh, we will keep them cool though, no matter what it takes, I will keep them cool next summer because they will get nailed with heat if I don't. So we'll get something figured out. If you guys have any suggestions for those of you who keep chickens on what I can do, um, because this area, like I can't move that. I mean, it's, it's there. I either need to have some years where I don't keep chickens and I let something grow and create shade or I go to plan B. I do have a fan installed in there that keeps air moving, but I'm thinking like a little window AC unit or something like that might work for the next few years until we get a tree big enough to create some shade. So anyway, that was probably a super long tour. I'm so sorry. Uh, I hope you enjoyed seeing everything. I think it's been a really good year. It's been a kind of a hard year in some ways. Um, but I think it's going to create lots of fun projects and um, we'll have lots and lots to show you guys next year. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this tour and we will see you in the next video. Bye.